All right, so we are in this brand new series. Um, and we are, this is week three, we've gone through two weeks. And here's just a recommendation. If you missed any of the past two weeks, uh, that's okay. But I recommend go back online on YouTube or our Facebook page and watch the previous two weeks because this series is designed to kind of build off each other. And it kind of goes, it kind of takes us through this journey together to understand completely how we kind of miss the brand new way of life that Jesus offers us. Because what we're exploring in this series is we're looking at how, how religion is a very powerful thing, but it can also be a very dangerous thing when used in an improper way. Because often religion can be fueled by superstition and fear. And what we're doing is looking at the brand new way of faith and religion that Jesus uh, brought to this earth when he came to this earth. And what we do is we tend to screw that up because we're all broken, failing humans. Because here's the truth. Our beliefs, no matter who you are, our beliefs are driven by our consciences. You see, our conscience determines religious realities, whether they reflect reality or not. And for an example, some of us may feel guilty for doing something in life while others don't. Depending on whatever that is, our consciences determine what our religious realities are. Sometimes we view things in certain ways differently than other people based off of how our consciences will determine that reality. An example would be, you know, just simply look at politics and how we vote. Now, this is a confession of mine. When I was 18 years old, freshman at Penn State Barron, uh, I, I didn't know anything, obviously. But I grew up in the church, and I grew up in a church that kind of taught you that you vote in a certain way, okay? Now, that as an 18 year old, that was an election year for a president. And so I was going into my first election to vote for a president and I had no idea what I was doing. I just figured, okay, I vote the way my church taught me to vote. Well, my roommate at Penn State Baron, his name was Matt, good dude, awesome guy. We had a good time together. He was also a very staunch atheist, which created a very unique dynamic in our dorm room. Me, follower of Jesus, him, God doesn't exist. And so that created a unique dynamic. But we got, became really good friends. It went really well. And then we got to this, you know, a couple months into it, we were going to be voting for who we wanted to be president. And my first thought was this, when he was very open that he'd be voting differently than me, I thought, well, of course, you're an atheist. Why would you ever vote the way I do? Because I just thought that you, if you believe certain things, you vote certain ways. And this is what, this is my conscience determined my religious reality, whether that was real or not. And this is just an example. We can see that in our lives still today. You see, our consciences have been shaped by a version of of Christianity, because here's the truth, no matter who you are, you've been impacted by Christianity. We live in a country where it's kind of hard not to be. Some sort of faith has infiltrated your life for good or bad reasons, and that has helped shape your conscience and your reality. Maybe you like that. Maybe you appreciate that. Maybe you're someone you don't appreciate that. Maybe you struggle with the idea of faith in Christianity and church because you've had a bad experience with it. But we feel the way we feel because this is what we've been taught. And here's the reason. The problem with this is because we bring in this temple model, this old way of doing things, this old way we've been looking at over the past couple weeks where it's a sacred place where you go, where the sacred text is taught, and it's taught by sacred men who are interpreting these sacred texts, and they are informing sincere followers. This is what we do. We go to a place to be taught by a certain person about how, what the, 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 the sacred texts mean, and we as sincere followers go and seek that information out. And what this teaches is this is how you work your way towards God. Now, this is not just a Christian thing or a Jewish thing. This temple model has been found all throughout history. You look at the Romans, the Mesopotamians, the Egyptians, they all followed this model where you go to a certain place and certain people will tell you this is how you interpret the text of how you earn your way to God. It if you do good, God will be happy with you. If you do bad, God will be angry with you. So you have to do enough good to earn your way to God, and that's the only way God will be fully accepting of you. And this is what we continually teach ourselves and teach other people. You work your way to God, and that leads to a lot of power for those sacred men. Because they're the ones who are the gatekeepers of heaven and hell. And they are the ones who are putting the heavy burdens on the followers. This is the system. And maybe you felt that in your own faith in Christian and church experience. You feel this heavy burden to kind of earn your way to God if you do enough right things. But then Jesus came and launched something brand new. 
something completely new that went away from the temple model. He launched this new movement, this ecclesia, this church, where he said, wherever you go, I will be with you. God will be with you. It's not about a place you go. And this new covenant where you don't have to earn your way to God, God came down to you in the form of Jesus, and he laid down his life for you. That's not about how good you are. Jesus did everything necessary to restore your relationship to God. And he gave a new meaning to the text. It's not about following 600-something rules. It's about knowing that Jesus fulfilled all of them. We just simply have to trust him. And he ushered in this new ethic, this new way of living. He says, listen, it's not about you, know, all, you following all these rules. It's about this. And he says, and Paul writes in Galatians 5, 6, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Aaron talked about this verse last week, that we love. This is our new ethic. But what we've done is often we've messed up this brand new thing by bringing the old way back into it. We brought the temple model back into our lives, and we can see that in our culture very easily. When we do this, we are being held back by the things that shouldn't hold us back. Let me give you an example. When you think of the word church, what do you think of? Do you think of a building, a place you go, something you do? Absolutely. But here's the problem with that. The word church, when Jesus used it in scripture, is this word ecclesia, which means the called out ones, the congregation of people. I introduced this a couple weeks ago, but it's a people group, people called out for God's purposes. But throughout time, that word eventually got replaced by a German word that literally meant house of the Lord. So when you think that, that's the reason it's been influenced to us that we think church is a place. That's because this word replaced and we don't teach ecclesia as, as we should. We teach house of the Lord, a place you go, something you do. And that's a big problem. That goes back to the temple model that you have to go to a sacred place to be close to God. But here's the truth. This is maybe one of the benefits we see with COVID right now. Some of us are here in person. And that's great. And some of you are watching online in your home. That's just as great. Because it's not about a place you go. It's about God being with us. And so this is something we can do. We can bring the old temple model back into the new model. But it's kind of like this. This is what we do. So imagine you are, you know, it's, it's cold right now. So let's think warm summer. Can you do that for me for a second? It feels good. It's a nice day out. And maybe you just have this great idea to go for a run one day. And maybe you're like, well, I don't run. Okay, a nice walk. And it's hot in the summer. And you get back to your house and it is just, you're sweaty. It's hot. And you would just like some nice, fresh cold water. And it just so happens that I show up, okay? I'm there as the pastor. I'm like, hey, I've got this nice cold water for you. Would you like some water? Like how many of you want some fresh water after a nice hot run or it's hot outside, right? But before I give it to you, this, this nice fresh water, I take a drop of sewage and just one little drop in that water. Do you still want that water? Absolutely not. But this is what we do. We take the good thing, the new thing, the fresh thing that Jesus brought in, and we just put a little bit of sewage, the old temple back into it, and it ruins it. It infiltrates it, and we miss the point. And this is what we do. And this is what we need to wrestle with today. And here's the tension I want us to really dig into, is am I, are we missing the new life Jesus offers by recycling the old life back into it? And the answer is yes, but let me explain to you how. And today is going to be like a mini history lesson. If you're a history buff, you're like, this is going to be great. If you're not a history person, you're like, this is going to be awful. Here's my challenge to you. Stay with me. Because this is, this is vital for us to understand and know. I promise this is going to help you. And at the very least, I think today is going to challenge you. Okay? Now, to start off, the church got off to a good start when Jesus commanded them to do this. In Matthew 28, 19 through 20, the last thing Jesus said before he ascended back up to heaven, he says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, first of all, I love that last line Jesus says, Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. He's like, surely, he's not saying, surely I'm in the building you have to go to to get to me. He's like, no, wherever you go, I will be there with you. That's amazing to hear. But he tells them, your job is to go to all nations and you're to make disciples. You're about to make disciples of those who are following me, committed followers of me. That is your job is go make them. Teach them everything I have commanded you to do. Everything Jesus taught to love, to serve, to care for, to follow God, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, love your neighbor as yourself. You go teach them the same thing I taught you. This new, brand new way of doing things you go tell them that. You're called, you're called to baptize them, to make, you know, to invite them to make this public declaration of their faith in me. And he calls them to do that. 
They did this very, very well at the beginning. They took this idea of faith expressing itself in love very seriously to the point the pagans in their culture could not believe what they were doing. The way they took care of orphans and abandoned children, the way they took care of the poor, the way they loved their enemies, it blew other people's minds what these Christians were doing. But what really threw them off is how they just weren't afraid of death. There was persecution all around the early church where they were losing their life for following Jesus and they were not scared of death. It blew everybody else's minds. They took this seriously, this brand new way of life that Jesus ushered in was flipping the world upside down. And then what happened is a couple decades after Jesus left, the temple got destroyed, the sacred place for the Jewish people where they would go and be informed by sacred men of what the sacred text meant and how they should live their lives. That thing got destroyed in a war, so there was no old temple to go back to. And this is like, this is good, all right. They can't even fall back to their old way of doing things because they can't even go back to this old temple. And so this thing is thriving at the beginning. Churches are starting. They're meeting in houses. They're meeting in public squares. They're doing whatever it takes to meet in and gather as a church, more people were experiencing the brand new way of life that Jesus ushered in. And the temple model is gone, right? I wish. Because in a little bit, it came back. It actually really came back a couple hundred years later when Constantine became emperor. Maybe you've heard of Constantine in your history classes growing up and things like that, but Constantine became the Roman emperor, emperor in 306 AD, and he was known as the first Christian Emperor. Now, that can be up for debate. Different scholars kind of like look at, was his faith legit or not? That's besides the point. He became this Christian emperor, and he really started to play the politics that really play into gaining favor with the Christians. And he gave Christians favor themselves. One of the things he did, it sounds really good, is he stopped the persecution of, of Christians. Before him, their, their lives were at risk for following Jesus. They were viewed as a threat to the Roman Empire, and they would lose their lives if they started any sort of ruckus. So he stopped the persecution of it. He outlawed crucifixions. He gave them back what was taken from them. So any church building they had or, or place they had where they met that was taken from them, he gave it back to them. He built basilicas. He supported the church financially. He gave clergy tax breaks, and he promoted Christians to higher roles in government offices. You see, Christians went from being the persecuted minority to the empowered majority under Constantine. And that all sounds well and good, right? Except in doing this, it, it allowed the old way of the temple to creep back in. It was like a couple drops of sewage ruining the brand new thing that Jesus called his followers to live. They made their own temple model with some Christianity in it. And here's an example. Uh, how many of you guys have ever heard the, of the Arian controversy? Yeah, I didn't think so. Anyway, so here's what this thing is. The Arian controversy was this scholarly and theological debate on what it meant on the word begotten in John 3, 16, that God gave his one and only begotten son. And the argument was basically this. Did Jesus become God when he was born or did he become God later in life? Did God bless him with this? Okay, now you've lived the good life. I'm making you God and now you'll be the savior of the world. This big argument, right? And so it doesn't seem like a, a big thing to us, but this was a huge deal in the fourth century. And this guy named Arius believed that Jesus' divinity was given to him as an adult for his faithful living. But Anna, Athanasius believed, and uh, that word, Athanasius, another dude who was involved with this whole debate, believed Jesus was born divine, okay? And this is an important topic, but the issue here is where it ended up, okay? Athanasius eventually won the argument. He won the argument that Jesus was divine when he was born. He was God you know, in the flesh as soon as he was in this world. He wasn't you know, just a normal human and then became God later in life. He won this argument. And as a church, that's what we believe. We believe that Jesus was divine at birth. We talked about that at Christmas just recently. This is what we believe. So great. Now this is orthodoxy in the church you know, in, in around 300 AD. Okay? This, you know, they can agree to disagree and move on, right? Well, that's not what happened. You see, Constantine stepped in, and he was so terrified of any sort of division or, or differing opinions within his kingdom, he laid down an edict. He didn't want there to be an, a, a division in his empire, and this became very political, and this was his, his edict that he wrote. He says, and I hereby make a public order that if someone should be discovered to have hidden a written composed by Arius and not to have immediately brought it forward and destroyed by fire, his penalty shall be death. 
So they have this big debate on when did Jesus become divine or not. One person won, the other person didn't. And just leave it at that, right? No. Constantly says, you know, if you have any writings by Arius, this is the Arian controversy, any writings, if you don't bring them forward, we find them that they, we, you have them in your library, your penalty will be death. Death for believing something different. This is crazy, right? But this is kind of what happens, is we let beliefs divide us and miss what Jesus is calling us to do. When uh, the camp I grew up going to in Slippery Rock is where I met my wife. I, it's a very fun place for me. I love it. Uh, something crazy like this happened there. Not, obviously not death, thankfully, but a big division that caused people to just go their separate ways and, separate ways and relationships to be broken. See, my home church believed a certain thing about baptism, and another church believed something else about baptism. And here was the issue. issue. Someone believed that baptism doesn't save you, and the other people believed, no, you have to be baptized to be saved. But they were both teaching you should be baptized. So there's just slight differences in what their theology was. Take the step to be baptized. That's what Jesus calls us to do. Well, it became this huge, disagreement and argument to the point where they don't even t- they didn't even talk to each other anymore. You know, we can't even be in the same room. We can't get along right now. We're going to break this relationship. And one church went one way, the other church went the separate ways, and they just let that divide them. You see, that's the old temple model creeping back into what Jesus calls us to do. What started happening is back in Constantine's era, it still happens today, is what you believe trumps how you behave. And when Jesus says we be known by our love, not by our theology, we miss the point where we're making division happen because of some differing beliefs when they're really not that big of a deal. And this is a dangerous way to live. And we can see that happening today. You know, there are people, maybe you don't say it this way, but you think it where I'm a Christian, but I'm not going to love that person because they believe blank. Or they did this, or they voted this way, or whatever that may be, and we let that get in the way of how God calls us to live in this brand new way that Jesus calls us to do. You know, this, this Galatians 5, 6 repeated, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself in love. You see, the early church would have never killed anyone for what they believed, ever. The early church wasn't making threats to the Roman Empire and the pagans for believing about gods or the gods differently than what they believed. They were never doing that. Instead, they loved their enemies. They served their enemies. They took care of the orphans and the widows, even if they were Roman, even if they were pagan. They took care of everybody around them. This is what they did. And then it all changed. Another temple model took over. The old way of doing things crept back in. Politics and faith intertwined. It again was about a sacred place with sacred men teaching sacred texts to sincere followers. And it gets so focused on getting your theology right that we often miss what Jesus calls us to, and that's to love. That's to love. You see, no one's ever been persecuted for loving too much. But you can see history show that people are persecuted and they lose their lives because of what they believe. I'm sure that's a risk that followers of Jesus and really all different types of followers of different religions take. But we're called to live this brand new way to love, not getting persecuted for that. See, the Christian version of the temple model started creeping in. Sacred men became the gatekeepers of heaven and hell. And Constantine, his era, kind of ushered that back in. And what we started seeing after that, there's more history, is, you know, as the church continued to gain power and become the empowered majority, we saw popes and bishops and archbishops, they gained all the power. This actually led up to the very first crusade, and you probably learned that about, about those in school too, these holy wars, about helping people, making them make sure they would be followers of Jesus. They defeated the Israelites and things like that. But this is what was crazy about this, is the more power the religious leaders got, other people became scared of them. Kings were terrified of the religious leaders when this stuff took place because they had the power because the religious leaders can say, you know what, if you don't do this, you will not be good with God. You will not have access to God. So the kings did whatever the religious leaders wanted them to do because they did not want to lose that access to God. They were scared. So the first crusade, this is what they did. The religious leaders were driving this thing. And the crusaders, these people would go into these towns and they would pillage and they would rape and they would kill. And they killed women and children, this disgusting thing. But it was okay because the religious leaders just said, listen, God wills it. God wills it. And we see this is an old temple model. I'm sorry, you cannot read the Gospels and justify going in and killing somebody else in the name of your faith. It's impossible. But 
this old temple model creeped back in, and the religious leaders were like, listen, this is okay because God wills it. And it's been a constant fight between the temple model and Jesus' brand new model ever since Constantine, and we continue to deal with it today. So the religious leaders gained all that power, the crusades happened, but then there was moments where people clung to the brand new way. You know, there were, there were small pockets of people saying, you know what, that's wrong. We should really fight against this. You know, some monks did that, but here's one of the big moments was this thing called the Reformation. And again, it's more history, but it's important. The Reformation, Martin Luther and others wanted to reform the church, not break away from it, but they started, they were called Protestants, and that's where you hear Catholics and Protestants, like the division there. Protestants got their name because they were protesting what the church was doing. That's where they got this name from. And they were protesting against the Catholic Church's ways. Martin Luther and others came up and they were reading Scripture like, listen, what I'm reading in Scripture matches nothing of what we're doing as the Catholic Church. So he starts fighting against it and saying, listen, I'm not trying to break away from you. Let's change this to be who we're supposed to be, what Scripture says we're supposed to be. So Martin Luther was against things like indulgences where, you know, you paid a certain amount of money, and if you did that, it, you know, relieved you of your sin or other people's sin in your family, and it gave you more access to God and all those things. Martin Luther was like, that's not in Scripture at all. Let's cut that out. You know, none of what the church was doing was taught or seen in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Like, this is not what we see. You're, we're trying to teach people they have to earn their way to God again, and Jesus very clearly comes and teaches that he is the way, the truth, and the life to God. We are messing this up. And so Martin Luther starts fighting against this. And this is where we start seeing things uh, that became a big piece of the faith where, like, for instance, sola fide popped up, this idea of faith alone. And what Martin Luther was saying in Scripture, it teaches that by faith alone are we saved, not by our works, not by our indulgences, not by our charity. We are saved, or we're rescued and redeemed by Jesus simply through faith and trust in him, nothing else, sola fide creeped up. And then the other, this thing he taught, sola scriptura, that Scripture... Not the church is the ultimate authority. Scripture, not the church, is the ultimate authority. Let me just be very clear. This is what we believe at One Church. The ultimate authority of how we know God, how we follow Jesus, is through Scripture, not the church. So if we ever decide something and say, here's what we're doing as a church, and it goes against Scripture, it's wrong. Because Scripture is our authority. And so Martin Luther and others started teaching this and, and really reforming things. The printing press was up and running, so they started printing the Bible in different languages. Martin Luther was known as an, you know, he was an outlaw to the Catholic Church, so he was hiding as he was trying to get the Bible printed in his German language for others to experience, to know this is how we know and follow God. And this awesome thing happens where the brand new way of things are, that Jesus ushered in is fighting it back against the old temple model that the Catholic Church was running. This is great, but then the Reformation became a temple model. Because what we do as people, they took Scripture and started using it as a weapon. Within Martin Luther's like you know crew, they started saying, "Well, no, you believe that, and I believe this, and I'm interpreting this this way, and you're interpreting it that way. And if you read it this way, you're wrong, and I'm right." And this big fight happens, and what happens? They start fracturing away from each other. They started disagreeing to the point you're like, you know what, you go your own way, I'll go my own way. And the old temple model came back in to the point that right now there are over 1,000 different denominations in the Protestant church. Over 1,000. Crazy, right? This is what we do. We put the sewage into the fresh water. Reminds me of a joke I heard one time. And there was a man who once saw another man you know, about to jump off a bridge and end his life. And he says to him, don't do it. And the other said, nobody loves me. He said, God loves you. Do, do you believe in God? The other said, yes. And the other man said, are you a Christian or a Jew? And the man on the bridge says, a Christian. And the man, you know, trying to talk him out of it says, me too. Are you Protestant or are you Catholic? And the guy says on the bridge, I'm Protestant. He's like, me too. What denomination? He goes, I'm Baptist. He says, me too. Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist? He said, Northern Baptist. And the guy said, me too. Northern conservative Baptist or Northern liberal Baptist? He said, well, I'm Northern conservative Baptist. And the guy says, me too. Are you Northern? conservative Baptist Great Lakes region or Northern Conservative Baptist Eastern region? And the guy on the bridge said, Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes region. And the man said, me too. Are you Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes region Council of 1879 or 
Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. And the man on the bridge says, Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. And the guy trying to stop him said, fine, die, heretic, and threw him off the bridge. <laughs> A little harsh, but this is what we do. We let things like that get in the way of being one. We let things like that get in the way of being brand new. We let things like that, you know, make the different temple models infiltrate the brand new model of Jesus, and it still happens today. And when this happens, one church, in person or online, love loses. We miss what Jesus calls us to do. It's not the way of Jesus. It's not the new movement. It's not the new covenant. It's not the new meaning of the text. It's not the new ethic. Love is the movement and the way of Jesus. And I kind of wonder, could, could Jesus have been any clearer? Like he does it, go do this. They will know you are my followers by your, by, by your love for each other. Go teach them, go show them. Could he have been more clear? You know, the Galatians 5, 6, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself in love. Or when Jesus tells his disciples this in John 13, 34 through 35, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you so that you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Not by which Baptist convention you're a part of or what denomination you're a part of, but by your love for one another. Because the love of Jesus transforms all of us. And it's easy for us to kind of sit back and make fun of this a little bit, tell ridiculous jokes, kind of critique what people used to do. Because it's always more comfortable putting the blame on somebody else. And to be sure, there is a lot of blame to go around. But here's the truth. And don't miss this. We all have a little temple model in us. Read that on the screen. Listen to it again. We all have a little temple model in us. That we hold on to this old way of doing things, and that holds us back. And maybe you think, well, that's not true, because I don't bash people over the head with the Bible. I love people. They can believe what they want to believe. I'm not forcing my beliefs on others. And if that's you, that's all well and good. I'm not condemning you or calling either of us out for that. I'm saying this. Let me ask you this. Have you ever thought these things? Have you ever thought about how close you can get to sinning without actually sinning? Right? That's temple model. When we're more focused on not ticking God off rather than trying to be as close to God as possible, that's temple model. Have you ever felt guiltier about missing church or mass than how you treat others? It's temple model. Have you ever feared the internal destiny of your children because of their baptism? Because someone said, if you don't baptize them this way and this time and this what method, they're not going to go to heaven. When you failed morally, and let's just confess this now, we've all failed morally. Were you more concerned about what God would do to you rather than the harm you did to the person involved with your sin? Do you ever think this? Do you believe there's a ritual that makes you right with God and removes responsibility to make restitution with the person you harmed? Jesus taught against this. Aaron mentioned this last week that Jesus even taught, if you go to God to you know, confess your sin, to make a sacrifice, but you have a problem with your neighbor, he said, go make it right with your neighbor before you make it right with God. God can wait. But a lot of times we do is we just go and we do the ritual and say, well, I'm good now. I don't have to worry about making it right with my neighbor or loving my neighbor or my coworker or my family. We're good now. Let me ask you this. Do other people's sin elicit feelings of superiority? Instead of, comp instead of compassion? You ever say, well, at least I don't do that. Or this, do, do your beliefs get in the way of your love? Well, listen, I wasn't here last week. And if I was, I would have talked about the whole situation with the U.S. Capitol. I wasn't here. But I want to say something now. And listen, I know we are a church of different political beliefs and leanings and, and, and ideologies, and that's great. I love that. So let me be very clear. As I'm about to say this, this is not an attack on your political beliefs. But this is a calling to who we're supposed to be as followers of Jesus. When I ask the question, do our beliefs get in the way of our love, you could easily argue that's what took place at the U.S. Capitol a couple weeks ago. Because here's what was crazy to me. It was a protest. It got ugly. It got crazy. People lost their lives. But the thing that got me 
And this is not a political leaning. It was the fact that I'm a follower of Jesus. Not that I'm a pastor, but simply I'm a follower of Jesus, like a lot of you. And I see things like Jesus' name attached to these moments. You know, storming and, and bringing violence and attacking and throwing fire extinguishers at people. And all these, you see these violence take place and people are like, you know, it's their faith that's driving them to do this. And I'm like, what is that? Because here's the truth. You can't look at the gospels. You can't look at the life of Jesus. You can't look at this brand new way that Jesus ushered in. You can't look at the New Testament of the church. You can't look at any of that and go, oh yeah, that's how we're supposed to act, just like that. That's not it at all. And I know what happens in these situations like, but what about this or what about them and what about this? If our argument against violence is, but what about them? Come on. You don't justify your sin by, ju by calling out somebody else's sin. That's temple model. And what we have done is we have constantly taken the sewage of the old temple model and dropped it in our fresh, clean water. And we look to justify that. And my challenge for all of us in the midst of this crazy situation that we're in in our country right now is this. You have to know where your allegiance lies. As followers of Jesus, we are called to a higher purpose, a higher calling, and a higher action of love. We are called to this brand new way of doing things, not the old temple model. So do your sins make you feel more superior or they bring compassion? Do you look at the things going on in our lives and go, that's not the way of Jesus. I'm called to do something else, something more, something better. You see, what we've been seeing constantly is this temple model, this old way of doing things, breaking up what God calls us to do. And the reason for this is this, is we don't fully embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ. The, things, the reason we're seeing this brokenness all around us, in our churches, in our communities, in our government, all this stuff, that we are not embracing the gospel of Jesus Christ to live and experience this brand new way of doing things. We have to fully trust and embrace the good news of who Jesus is and what he has done. So who is Jesus? He's God. He is our rescuer. He is our redeemer. He is our teacher. He's our Lord. He's our Messiah and our Savior. And all of our hopes can rest in him. And what he has done is this, is he was the perfect sacrifice to pay for yours and my sin, that he laid down his life and rose again in three days, that he came to us because we could not get to God because we couldn't do it. He offers us a brand new life. And through Jesus, we are good with God. Through Jesus, we are good with God, but we don't embrace this good news. We go back to earning our way and trying to do all the right things. It leads us to creating our own temple model and not living the brand new life Jesus died to give you. So my challenge for you is this. If you're in person, online, wherever you're at, is believe the good news of Jesus. Embrace the gospel. Trust that Jesus is enough. Maybe the tension and guilt you feel with God is not because you don't measure up, because the truth is you never will measure up to God, but because you have not fully, truly believed that Jesus is enough for you. Because here's the truth. Jesus died for you. Jesus died for you. If someone dies for you, then they are for you, not against you. God's love for you and those around you must inform your conscience and shape your behaviors to accept God's love and love others. I mentioned Constantine earlier, and this is where Constantine's faith gets really questionable. I, I, I don't doubt that he believed the Christian message. You know, I don't doubt that in heaven, Constantine's going to be up there hanging out and you know, giving glory to Jesus for eternity. Like That's very reasonable to believe, but here's where Constantine you know, gets a little questionable. As Constantine was a Christian, but he still did what he wanted, still was greedy, still was about power. In fact, he did not choose to get baptized to proclaim his faith in Jesus until he was on his deathbed because he wanted to make sure that all of his sins were covered. But here's the thing, that's temple model thinking. See, baptism is not this thing of, okay, it's going to fix all the mess ups you did before, but not the ones going forward. No, baptism is simply our public declaration of my faith that Jesus covers all my sin. That's what it calls us to do. Baptism is this thing that shows that we are living this new life, new life, not this old temple model. 
Maybe that's you. Maybe you've never taken that step because you feel like, I'm not ready, and I'm like, I can't do that. But listen, if you believe that Jesus is Lord, that he died for you and died for your sin, and you get forgiven through Jesus, and you are made right with God through Jesus, and you've never been baptized, that's a step for you to take. I encourage you to do that. If you're watching online or in person, take that step. Maybe you've been holding back because you get you know, caught up in this old temple model. Don't do that anymore. Because here's the one thing. And this is the simplest way I can, I can put it today, because we covered a lot of stuff today, is this. Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. When you question your status within your standing with God, Jesus is enough. If you're feeling guilty because you missed church, but you're not worried about how you treat your neighbor, a reminder, Jesus is enough, and that should inform you of what you believe and how you act. Jesus is enough for all of that. When we trust the good news of Jesus, we are fine with God, and our job is then to help others be fine with God too. And if you're not fine with God, you can do that today. Not through a ritual or anything like that, but simply believing in Jesus that he is enough. If you are fine with God, then help others by the, do the same by loving them by pointing them to Jesus, to teach them that Jesus is enough because they will know we are Christians by our love. Listen, this series is challenging. I get that, but hang with us. Keep going. Don't miss next week. But what we're going to do right now is I'm going to pray. We're going to worship. I went a little long, but that's okay because there's a lot to say today. But we're going to worship, and after this next song, we're going to take communion together as a reminder that Jesus is enough. So let's pray, let's worship, and let's, uh, let's take communion after that. God, thank you so much for today. We thank you for Jesus, that he is enough. God, we thank you for, the, in the midst of everything we're living in, God, that we can be reminded of who you are and the brand new way you invite us to live. And God, I just pray that you help us to you know, convict our hearts, call us to repent, call us to fight against this old temple model way of doing things. God, help us to not put the sewage in the water. We trust you, we love you, and we love others. And we're reminded that we're not trying to work our way to you, that we don't have it all figured out, but we have you, and that is enough. God, we thank you for that truth. It's your only prayer. Amen.